Melissa, thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. How are you doing? I'm good. Good. It's nice outside. The rain stopped. I'm good. I know, right? (laughs) I'm looking forward to shaving my um, playoff beard. Oh, yeah, me too. (laughs) (laughs) Go Caps, right? Go Caps. Um, Okay. We're going to start off with rapid fire questions. Okay. Okay. So don't think about it. Just Just say it. Got it. Dogs or cats? Dogs. Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Wars. Uh, Rolling Stones or Beatles? Beatles. Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Beach or mountains? Beach for sure. PC or Mac? PC. What was that? Was that this guy? Ding, ding, ding. That was, uh, yeah, look at that. Uh, East Coast or West Coast? East. Are you saying that because you were born and raised here and lived yes. here? You don't like going over You want over my there. preference? Yeah. West. <laughs> that's what, that's what, okay. But I mean, yeah, I have to say East Coast. I'm an East Coast girl. I have to say East Coast. You kind of got the California thing going on, though. Oh, um, I, maybe. I don't know. Uh, Kramer or Costanza? Kramer. Superman, Batman? Superman. All right, here we go. This is the biggest one. Kardashians or Osbournes? Kardashians. Really? Yeah. Okay. You like the Kardashians? I don't. <laughs> but if <laughs> I have to like pick between one or the other, they're okay. I mean, yeah. I like, you know, if they're philanthropic in some way, I like that part of things. But I could do without five billion selfies and oh tweaking selfies and, and all the that. Duck, and the duck lips. And the duck lips. Have you ever taken a duck lick, duck uh, lip no, picture? I have not. Good for you. Let's, let's hope I don't start. <laughs> all right. So you got that out of the way. Got it out of the way. I feel good. Uh, so you grew up. In Gaithersburg. I did. Tell me about that. So, uh, born in Tacoma Park at Washington at Venice and grew up in Gaithersburg. And my parents are still in the house that I grew up in from, you know, third grade on. Um, My dad's a builder, so he built our house in third grade. And and it's still sort of like he did their house. Yeah. And my house, actually. But um, did it really? It's sort of, yeah. It's sort of the homestead. And we all kind of come back there in the summer and you know they have a pool and stuff so now our kids are doing all the things we did nice. when we were their age great my old house um you went to gaithersburg high school yes did you know what you wanted to do in high school i knew what i wanted to do in elementary school really just from we watched tv had it on in the background like most people a yeah. lot growing up and it was always channel four and it was always Jim Vance and Dorian Gensler. And I would watch sort of in awe and think, man, that looks cool. Really? I want to do that. I want to be in that building. And so for years and years, I always thought that's where I wanted to end up. So when years later, the opportunity presented itself, I sort of couldn't believe my good fortune. What about it intrigued you? I think that I thought watching the reporters out in the field that it was cool to meet people and tell their stories. Every day you get to tell a different story. Okay. And that's what sort of intrigued me. And I thought, this can't be that hard, can it? You know, yeah. if, if I get to tell my own stories about other people, how can that be difficult? And then, of course, everybody, uh, well, I should say lots of people who start getting into TV, the ultimate goal is anchor. And you think, oh, man, I want to sit on the desk and make all the money, and, yeah. you know. And um a long time ago, that was probably the case, like in the 80s and 90s, you know, it was a super duper lucrative thing to do. And it's, sure. I'm not saying it's not a great industry, but it's probably not quite the same. It had a lot of magic around it, I feel like, before. And um, now I love it and I wouldn't change what I do. I'm looking forward to to more magic, though. So we'll get into the career. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I'm afraid I'm going to forget this question, so I'll ask. Oh, go now. for it. With you have, there's more options now, not only for viewers but for you, for your career. Because mm-hmm. how many news channels are there now? I know. Oh my God. I yeah. mean, who knows, right? I mean, it, all the local stations, of course, it's four, five, seven, and nine sure. in DC, uh, just like any other city. But I mean, you have a million different CNN and MSNBC and CNBC and Fox News so and as everything. As a reporter, does that give you a good feeling or? Do you, you feel more competitive that way? Uh, I feel like it's going to oversaturate at some point. Yeah. And most people are now going to their phones. We do tons of research at Channel 4, and we know that a lot of people look at their phones in the morning. Yeah. That's the first thing you do, right? Your alarm goes off, you stop it, you look, you go through your feeds. What's important to you is what's going to pop up. Mm-hmm. Then they go to the TV for mostly weather, then traffic, and then the news. Because it's sort of, you know, Viewership on demand. When you're looking at your phone, it's what you care about. You know, so a, a former guest of the podcast, Alan Stein, has a ritual that he does not grab his phone, look at his phone for the first hour of his day. 
I love him. And I can't, I've tried. I can't do it. So does he have an <coughs> old school me. alarm? His, his like, phone what? turns, his phone, you know what? <laughs> I, I think in the podcast, he says he doesn't even use an alarm. That his, he's conditioned him. He's a performance coach. So he's conditioned himself to wake up every, you know, so he wakes up at six every day. I think it's six. There's no chance I could condition myself no, to wake up when I wake no. up. It's not going to happen. But I, I mean, reluctantly, I, I don't know why it's habit now. I was, <clears throat> excuse me. I think it's an addiction that it's what I grab the first thing in the morning. I, wake I know. Up. So my alarm goes off on my personal phone and then I have a work phone and then my husband has a phone. So we have the one <laughs> alarm, mine that goes off at 235 and then the second one goes off at 238 and then my husband's. And it's not that I lay there, I get up. It's just in case one of them dies in the middle of the night or fails somehow. So I'm going to get back to when you wake up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me, I don't know what's going on with me today. All right, so... In elementary school, you yes. wanted to be a reporter, TV I did. reporter. So, when you were there, options at Gaithersburg High School? Isn't that a? Um, they, they have uh, what do they call that? Like, like a, an IB program? Yeah, or or a. Or a um, they have like mechanic school there. Don't oh they? yes, they yeah. do. They do. Do they have anything like a TV really production? Big, no, or um, not in that way. No, they had. There was a studio, but we really didn't use it. So, in elementary school. Um, there was it was something called AM Goshen. It was like the morning newscast. And okay. we would sit there and I think it was a couple of times a week and we would anchor quote unquote and you, from you did that? I did it. Yeah. So I would love I would pay a lot of money yeah. for those tapes, you know, to see that. Do you remember the first time you did that? I don't remember the first time. I remember doing it. Okay. But I don't remember the first time. So that was huge because it was about the time where I started thinking, what do I want to do? Yeah. I know that's a little early for somebody to be thinking, what do you want to do? But I was interested in it. Yeah. I know a lot of kids who are interested in certain things and will take that path, even from a young age. So when I became interested and then all of a sudden this AM Goshen thing happened, and then in middle school, we did more TV production type stuff with mm -hmm. the teacher I had at Gaithersburg Intermediate School. And then in high school, it sort of died out because we didn't use the studio very much. But then in college, okay. I did it again, and I was majoring in it. Um I just rem I just was reminded um, Alan did the commencement speech yesterday for Gaithersburg High School. So it's a small world. Alan. Who we just talked about. Um, with oh, the, oh, oh yeah. same guy. Same really? Guy. Yeah. Did he? That's yeah, cool. It, Constitution? Uh -huh, Constitution Hall. That's where I graduated from. Look at that. Good old G-Bird. It's coming around. Go Trojans. <laughs> um, so in the last podcast, I mentioned that I knew what I wanted to do like at seven. Like okay. At age seven. So there you go. So where do you think that comes from? I think that that's been, are we both like a little bit crazy? Maybe you know. So <laughs> who I was talking to was like that must mean you're driven. I'm like no, I don't think so. At seven, I just kind of I don't you know. You just have I just an had, interest and you stick with it. I guess. You think this sounds like it fits me. And it well, sounds... what I said was I wanted to be the recording engineer for Van Halen when I grew up. Oh. Okay. And then somehow I figured out at that age that there was only like five guys in the world that really did that. And I had likelihood of me, I was doing the run in the odds and that probably wasn't going to happen. <laughs> so you're running the odds even at that age. That's pretty good. <laughs> Um, so my room was just filled with like guitar magazines and stuff. So I and had a, you just, you, I had an inclination. Yeah, but. I think you just. I don't think it's necessarily driven. I think, um, you know, your family unit can somehow push you in a certain direction yeah. if if you need that oomph. And I'm sure that I had that growing up, and perhaps you did too. But I think some people just sort of know, and it doesn't make you more or less successful. It's just you have this gut feeling. That's so, what I like. So were your parents supportive of you wanting to be on TV? Yes, yeah? very. So I remember my dad buying, do you remember the huge VHS camcorders? <laughs> yeah. Huge. And he would oh, carry, ginormous. oh yeah, and he would carry the VCR on yeah. his hip, yeah. you know, on, in a huge strap. Thing. I mean, it was ridiculous. Yeah. But I remember that. And we would take, my cousins and I and my brother would take that every holiday whenever we were together and we'd set it up and turn it around we'd have the vcr oh unit gosh. and everything and we'd do oprah shows and talk shows and everything and all my cousins participated but i definitely if you watch these videos you can see i was uh could you excited. imagine if there was youtube back then i mean because that's what no, that is no, you I were think, doing youtube shows on a vhs player. goodness because some of the stuff i would do um phil collins oh songs i would dance to phil collins do workout videos do you care to sing a phil collins Lots song of, oh today? my god no <laughs> there's one thing i can't do it sing <laughs> <laughs> so they were supportive. They didn't think that was a far-fetched, crazy dream of you wanting no, to be on TV. Because it wasn't me saying, I want to go to Hollywood and I'm going to you know, move out there and be this famous actress. Yeah. It was, I want to cover the news. 
uh, for a TV station and I want to stay in my hometown. And they're like, okay, yep, sounds good. Stay here. I think here. that's wild that you're doing exactly what you wanted to do <laughs> when you were station. in elementary school. At the same station, it's let, weird. let alone. Well, that was the goal. So I had this thing in mind that I wanted to be at Channel 4 by age 30. Okay. And I made it. I did make it. Like barely, but I did make it. So... Let's go back a little bit. Okay. You went to James Madison, mm -hmm. <coughs> home of Charles Haley from the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah. I have to oh, throw that God. in there. Oh, God. Come on. I'm sure there's a Redskin or two Clark, that's gone there. I think Gary Clark, I think, Lindsay Zarniak went there. Did she? One of my good friends from JMU. She's up at ESPN now? She was there. Now she's kind of doing some stuff for us as well. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, did you, what was your degree in? Or Broadcast your journalism, okay. communications. It was called media arts and design. Did there. you feel like you were getting closer when you were there? Like to your ultimate goal or? For sure. Yeah. yeah. I think that though any, at any college, the case is you get all this experience and it, it's great, you know, and you work on the school TV show and maybe you write for the newspaper or do something for the yearbook and take all these classes. But until you get really into the job, the practical experiences yeah. are way more valuable, right. even though I'm very glad, you yeah. know, for the education that I have, for sure, I've, I've used that quite a bit, but I'm just saying real world experience as with anything. So we talked about this the other day, about going to college. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend, I don't know if I should throw this at you, but I will, would you recommend someone that wants to be on TV to go to college for specifically like being a reporter or an anchor? I think it's a great base. I think that you need to know, you know, a little bit about as much as you can, for sure, in our yeah. industry. And it's great for whatever you want to do. I don't necessarily think college is for everybody. And I don't necessarily think that you have to go to college to be a reporter. I yeah. mean, you can Google, I'm sure lots and lots of reporters and very successful anchors did not attend school for one reason or the other. Um, I also don't know that I've ever been asked for a transcript or a degree or anything like that, you know, yeah. um, so they believe me. <laughs> Breaking news, I didn't actually go to JMU. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, so you graduated from there. Mm -hmm. What did you do after you graduated? Like you had a goal in mind for yes, years at that point. I did. How did you go about, did you go straight to, I have a list here of all the places you worked. Oh, let's, really? Let's go over this Where list. did we find this? I hope this is, okay, let's hear it. You were a reporter at WHAG. I was. In Hagerstown, Maryland. Uh -huh. um, when you took that job, that's not a number one market. No, that was job number two. That was job, what was job number one? Job number one was that, um, it was called Cable News 21 in Rockville. Okay. Right off of Standish Place, kind of sure. on Goody Drive. And I, it was kind of a county TV station. Now they do a lot of training. It's called Montgomery Community Media. Mm -hmm. And so I saw it one day when I was home on a spring break during college. And I was looking and I thought, this is local. This is news. Oh, I can definitely, come on. This is perfect, you know? So I talked to my parents and I said, look, I want to interview at this place. But can I take the summer off first? I had worked or interned somewhere every summer since I was, you know, 14 years old, babysitting, yeah. whatever. And they said, okay. So I took, you know, I don't know, seven or eight weeks off after graduation. And then I marched myself in there and I told the news director at the time that he was going to hire me. Really? <laughs> he still tells the story. I did. I did. I said something like, he said he was having a bad day. And I said, well, it's going to be a better day now because you're going to hire me. And I'm going to start, you know, working tomorrow. And he called me later and he said, I, yeah, you're hired. So I was there for about a year and a half. What gave you that <laughs> gumption? I don't know. I'm assuming you're like 21, somewhere uh, around there. Yeah, 22. Yeah. I was 22. I would, you know, maybe I'm a revisionist history, perhaps. Yeah. It sounded a lot cooler now looking you back. The mic. I was probably, yeah, I dropped the <laughs> mic and I left. Um, I was probably a bit more timid than that. But that was how I felt inside. Yeah. And it worked. Okay. So I, I don't know where I got the confidence from, but I just thought I can do this. And my resume tape is as good as what I'm saying here. So you should hire me. Did you happen to bring in the VHS tapes of oh, yeah. the Phil Collins? Oh, here? To oh, to him? Job? No, he definitely, <laughs> that might have gotten me fired before I was hired. So I remember, you know, you, you, you do the really silly video stuff in college. Oh, yeah. When you get out of college, you're trying to get a job and you're trying to put a demo reel together. And that was the hardest thing in the world because it sucked. Everything yeah. sucked. 
you know, comparatively speaking. Oh, yeah. And then do you recall that first, like, reel that you had? Um, A little bit. Gosh, you know, my mom has all of it. Does she still? Oh, she has everything. She probably has 11 copies of that first tape. I think tape, the folks know? at NBC should talk, call your mom. <laughs> I don't know. Put that on TV. I don't know. That actually would probably uh, do quite well on social media yeah. these days. Something funny for people to enjoy. I remember I interned at Channel 4 one year before my senior year of college, and they let me you know, anchor a newscast at you know 7.30 at night when everybody yeah. was gone. And it was on closed circuit TV throughout the station. And I'm sitting there smiling, talking about some horrible thing. And somebody came over to me and said, um, A lot of people died. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, I was so excited to be sitting there. And she said, You know, you shouldn't smile when you're talking about it. And I thought, Oh, yeah. I was sorry. I was just so excited to be here. Um, so when you got that internship, were you just, mm -hmm. I mean, on Cloud Nine? I that's, was. It's where you wanted it. You were almost there outside of a paying job, but you yes. were interning at the station that you wanted to work at your entire life. I was. I was interning. So my first, I interned there two years in a row. First year, I actually got the internship. It's it, Now, it's like crazy. We have a thousand people, not a thousand, but a lot of people applying for five spots. And you have to It's be, just five spots? Typically, yeah. And it rotates wow. throughout the year. We have a you know spring, mm -hmm. summer, fall, winter. Um, and you have to be cream of the crop, top of everything. I don't think I was cream of the crop, top of anything. However... My mom, who's a county school teacher, her principal's daughter worked at Channel 4. And so my mom said to her principal, my daughter loves Channel 4, wants to work in TV. What can you do? So I called her daughter, and I explained everything. And she said, we have one internship left, and it's in human resources. Do you want it? And I was like, oh, yes, I'll take it. I'll yeah. take it. I'll take it. So I took it and worked in HR for the summer. And then they knew what I really wanted to do. I just wanted to get my foot in the door, literally. So they would let me go down and watch um, Jim Hanley and Pat Lawson Muse and sometimes Doreen and Jim. That was sort of my treat oh, man. for working. Yeah. At the time, uh, TV internships were free. You had to work for free. Now they're generally paid. So what what is Channel 4 looking for in an intern now? I think in an intern now, you have to be driven. You have to, when you come in there for an interview or do a Skype interview, you have to show that you really want this. You have to show a general knowledge for news. I mean, they're gonna ask you questions, you know, what about this or what about that or who is this person or who is that person? You have to have a general knowledge. Yeah. You don't have to know everything, but you need to prove that you really want to be there. And I think they're also looking down the line, what do you want to do? You wanna be an entertainment reporter? This might not be the place for you. Do you want to be a TV producer? Awesome. When students walk in and say, I want to be an anchor, a eh, little bit of a red flag because you want them to want to go out in the field first. You're not going to start as an anchor. You're going to start out in the field as a reporter. Do you reporter. think that's a millennial entitlement kind of thing? Um, I think people have been saying that for a long time. I remember my professors telling me, don't walk in there and say you want to be an anchor. Yeah. They don't want to hear that. Um, I think there's a little bit of the entitlement stuff for sure. I see it here and there, and it's upsetting. Yeah. I mean, both of us have young children, and it's like, oh, no. So I get that all heading? the time when people want to come here and work. I always say, what do you want to do? Director. So that's anchor director. Yeah. And I always think that's hysterical because they don't want to do. They the, don't want to step up. They don't want to step up, and they don't want to. I mean, I never, ever have people go get coffee and that kind of thing. But I when I got out of college, I was doing just, just menial tasks yeah. and getting the coffee. But that my career path, I had every job within the television production. But that makes you so much more valuable to yourself. Right. I, mean, you I, I know say I had more tools everything. in the toolbox. Yeah, I agree. But what they don't understand, okay, if you want to be a director, you have to know how to shoot a camera in order to convey what you want out of the cameraman or from the cameraman. Um, or the editor, or things like that. I would assume it's the same thing as an anchor. You know how you know you need to know how to put a story together in order to talk about it. So if you yeah. are, if you are a reporter on the field, that'll only prepare you to be that that anchor you need to be. Yeah, you need to learn compassion out in the field. You need to learn how to write to your video yeah. when you're covering a story. You need to learn how to convey that so that people feel like they're there that they really understand the story and then present it from the anchor desk, fine. But that's the last stop yeah. for somebody. You don't end up on an anchor desk in Washington and wanna leave. Right.
you know, yeah. that's been the goal. So when you were a reporter on the field, mm-hmm. in the field, um, what was your favorite story? Oh, my goodness. I covered so many cool stories. Um, so when I was in Colorado working at Fox in Denver for five years, um, the fun part of that job was I went to L.A. quite a bit to cover American Idol. Okay. So that was when American Idol was like Like who were really, the finalists those years? I mean, it was like like Blake Shelton and all those guys. But, it, I mean, it was Simon and Randy yeah. and Paula, American Idol, the, the original yeah. like, start out crew. That was really fun and really cool. Um, so those stories were all fun. I have one story, two stories, it, that happened in Colorado that really still stayed with me. So there was a teenager who was in a car crash after school, and he was actually hit with his best friend in the car, mm. a girl, by another student at the same high school who had been drinking right after school. I mean, this was like right three, yeah, three thirty yeah. or four in the afternoon, and he survived. Thank goodness, the passenger did not. Mm. And so, I was covered, assigned to go cover the story, and I remember standing outside the hospital and thinking, "This is just awful." His family came out. They talked to me, and explained that his insurance for whatever reason he was leaving the hospital but his insurance would not cover a wheelchair and i thought this is the most ridiculous thing but huh. instead of fighting the insurance and all that who knows how long that's going to take i just called a wheelchair supply company and i said here's the situation my name is melissa malay i'm with fox 31 can you do this bam kid yeah. has a wheelchair for three months and i still talk to this kid on facebook do you really yeah and that was like 11 years ago um, so through his journey of getting better, we just stayed in touch, and I did follow-ups with him. And that that's something that stays with me because I could make a little bit of a difference. Did you win an award for that? Not for that. Was so, it the oh. Colorado Broadcasters Association oh, Award? No, no, no. That was something else. That's a cool story. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Very good. Uh, we were in Georgetown, Colorado, which is on the way to Vail and Beaver Creek okay. and all that outside of Denver. And my photographer and I were sitting in the car covering a windstorm. It was just super windy. I mean, Colorado is crazy weather. It's yeah. always, you know, there are forest fires that are uh, pushed by the winds and everything. Crazy winds. So, a lot of news. A lot of news. So we're sitting in a Jeep. And all of a sudden, I looked to my left. I was on the phone with my mom. Looked to my left. And across this just flat area between the mountains... All this dust and stuff was coming, 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 coming. It slammed into the side of our car and it shattered our window out. We were just parked dust. on the side of our dust. Really? And some rocks in okay. there shattered the window out. So my photographer got like a little cut on his hand. I was fine. I'm screaming. My mom's freaking out because I'm on the phone with her. You know, I tell her we're okay. We're okay. So we go about a mile up the road and pull over into the closest um, gas station and like seven other cars pull in behind us. One guy has his blood on his head, his wind, sh- his uh, sunroof has exploded other people same thing all from this storm it was just such really? a freak thing so we pull out the camera of course and i start interviewing people let me see this let me see that this guy's cut whatever we put the story together in like two minutes yeah and ended up winning a colorado That's broadcast crazy. association award that was cool i mean it was an interesting story thankfully nobody really but that got does hurt, speak to really taking the, the uh, opportunities that you have and jumping on them oh yeah I mean, you have to. I mean, you could have sat there and was just like, oh, whoa, it's me. Calling the station, freaking out or something, come pick me up. But we uh, did the story, took it back to the station, had to drive back with no windows, which was, as you might imagine, a little chilly in the Colorado mountains. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. How long did it take to clean the dust out of that car? I know. A while. I think they sent it off. Um, Okay. News Channel 8 here in DC. Uh huh. What was that like? Cool. It was good. I wanted, so after I left Hagerstown, um, I was looking for something um, still in the area, but perhaps paying a little more. You start out in a very small market. You make very little money. I was going to work at 11 p.m. and doing. Did you live in Hagerstown? Well, no, not at the time. I was living with my parents getting up at 11 a.m. They were, I mean, 11 p.m. They are in Gaithersburg. That's what, two hour drive? It's like an hour and 15. Is it? Yeah, it's not as bad as you would think. In the middle of the night, yes. Counter commuting, yes. Um, but I did move to Frederick to be closer, and then it was like a half hour. Counter commuting. Counter commuting. We'll get into that, but that's a traffic, traffic term right that's there. That's a traffic term right there. <laughs> uh, so that was kind of big city work. It's in DC. Yes, They're connected to like ABC somehow. Yeah, so it's ABC 7 News Channel 8. So I went from Hagerstown there, and I was a one man band. So I was carried my own stuff, shot my own stuff, no way. brought my own lights. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you edit? Edit. 
Everything. What did you guys edit on? Oh my god, you're gonna ask me this. Final cut. Oh, you did. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And... I had to think. Oh wow. So you would yeah. take it back to the. the... No, what I would do is because I was a Montgomery County Bureau reporter and I had all my own gear. We or they, we, they had a little. I'm not kidding you. Closet. Oh my gosh. In Rockville, in the executive building on Monroe, and. I had a little key, and I'd go in there, and I'd lug all my st- lay all my stuff down, and I would, you know, pull my camera out and track it, and then load everything into Final Cut, Worked edit out of it, the closet. and feed it back to them. It's crazy. Every day. Got the job done, though. Got the job done. Shoulder still hurts from carrying the tripod. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Look at that big one right there. <laughs> I was looking at it. I'm eyeing that That's thing. Right, like, I, I know. You see me looking at it. I'm like, no. I no, know no. those things. Um, <laughs> and then you got the job. Got the job. Got the job. What the was that job. like? At NBC? Yeah when you first got that job where you just like what was that explain that because this is what you wanted so, since you were elementary student. yes so i started out freelancing so i think I did, it wasn't like a you got the job right. you're in you're awesome it was like a normal thing in bigger markets okay you know start your freelancing yeah. you don't have a space right now freelancing kind of doing what see. freelance reporting okay so freelancing meaning you know your schedule is wonky and they need you when they need you and you get it basically you're on day call. rate yeah, yeah you're kind of on call so they did me you know, three days one week and seven days the next week and then not for a month. And then, you know, so I did that for a couple of years. And it's what I wanted and it worked for them too. We had had our first child who's now eight and a half. Okay, so you by that time you had gotten married, had your yep. first kid. Got married. Okay. First kid. Um, we were living in Denver when we had the baby. We okay. moved back here because my husband wanted to change careers. He was a sports writer. Okay. And he wanted to go to law school. So we moved back here. I said, I'm not... You know, we're not doing law school in Colorado. You're not home. We have a new baby. I have no idea what I'm doing with this child. And then I'm working full time. We can't do it. So we need to move home for the support. So we came back here. He's from Bethesda. Okay. So So it worked worked out out. for both of you. It worked out. Moved in with mom and dad. We did. You got to do what you got to (laughs) do. You like that house. I like that house. I like that house. That's the house. I do. (laughs) And you sound like you got great parents. We do. My brother and I have great parents. Listen, any dad that would go out and buy that monstrosity of a VH player and carry the recorder because they weren't the same things at that no, time. No, 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 no. Two separate things. Got a good things. dad there. Yeah. I wish we still had that thing. It's probably worth a little something now. Maybe you, not. You know what? It's I, I've seen some. I get dragged to like antique stores and they're always there. And they're there. Really? Yeah, they're always there. I would love to see that yeah. thing again. It had a plastic case over it. it. I remember the whole thing. <laughs> I always thought it was, I grew up editing uh, music videos, having two of those things. And I would just record MTV and then like cut it together. Oh my gosh. You really were into it. I mean, I just had like this dream way in the distance. You were doing it. Yeah. But you know what? I was never in the AV club. Really? I just want to throw that out there. Okay. Gotcha. (laughs) Um, You won an Emmy. At NBC f- Washington is yeah. what we call it now. It used yes. to be. Yeah, they kind of, yeah. yeah. Um, so I won an Emmy, uh, I think it was 2013 or 14 for ironically a story about a beltway closure. And it was right before I got the job. The full So you were still freelancing. I was still freelancing. Do you think that got you the gig? No, because we had already kind of signed the deal before okay. that happened. Um, but it was right around the same time. So when I give my Emmy Award acceptance speech, I think my boss for getting me into traffic because it seemed like <laughs> it actually all worked out. See, I can do traffic. I can do well, traffic. Wait a minute. So you guys moved back from Denver uh-huh. with a new baby. Eight, eight months old. Yes. Freelancing. Freelancing. Your he husband was going to school. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How did you do that? Total madness. Okay. Total madness. I don't, I tease my husband that he didn't cook for three years because I was around much more. And my family was helping us. Uh, he cleaned everything because yeah, he yeah. wasn't there in time to cook. Right. But when he got home from school, he was like dish guy. So what were those periods of like you mentioned that you wouldn't work for a month? What was that like? Um, so probably the longest I went was like two or three weeks where they didn't need anything. It's always nerve wracking. Right. right. Because you think, I think when you're not working, you always think I'll never work again. And I wish that I didn't have that mentality because looking back, it's like, man, I should have really enjoyed that a little more. That, that downtime, that was kind of nice, If you knew nice, what right? was on the other side of that Yes, if I call, knew it was going to be yeah. totally crazy and I was going to have three kids, it's like, whoa. So there were moments where you didn't think you didn't think you were going to get called again. Yeah, you just don't know. Yeah. I mean, I thought I probably would, but you know, maybe they hire somebody else. Maybe they want a guy doing the job. I mean, who knows? Yeah. You just don't know. So you're always like a little bit nervous. But then when I got the call, 
hey, we want you to do traffic. You're from here. You know the roads. We like your news judgment. I mean, it's all about news judgment. I need to decide what is important to the people that are watching our channel, my commuters. Okay. So they kind of pitched it to me, and I thought, traffic? Right. I'd never thought of it before. And then the next day I called back and I said, yeah, traffic. This sounds good. And I'm so glad I did it. It was at a point in my career where I'd been in the business 13 or 14 years. You sometimes get a little tired of the negative, sad stuff yeah. or being sent somewhere and doing a sad story. And I thought this is the perfect change. And I'm really glad because I, in this position, feel like I can help people every day, them navigate sure. their morning. It's like practical help. Sure. Um, speaking of that practical help, do you have any traffic inside information for people that live in D.C.? <laughs> any back yeah. ways that Alla are Allow some extra time wherever you go. Well, that's the problem with D.C., right? The Beltway. I mean, find an alternate across the American Legion well, Bridge, right? I, you know what? I've been petitioning that. I mean, to myself. I don't go, to like, I don't yourself. go to like county meetings I like, or anything. I like that. But um, I have this inner dialogue with myself uh -huh. that we need another. For those that are listening in D.C., we mm -hmm. only have one way to get in from Montgomery County, to, really. I know. There's the ferry. Yeah, you can go White's Ferry, which, by which the way, is, is closed. Fine. We, what know, do you mean? Well, it's closed today. It's flooded. The oh. river's too high. There's debris in the water. The okay. road is closed. Yeah. So on days like that, Look at forget you. it. Um <laughs> There's no other bridge. No, there know. should be. I know. But they I agree say it's with protected. you. Mm. I agree with you. We need another way. It's just yeah. too many people are here. I know people from in, in Montgomery County that have never been to Virginia, like what? Tyson's. Yeah, and they say traffic. Wait, what? They've never been over there. I'm over there three or four times a week. Are you kidding? Yeah. Can I talk to them? You can talk to them. Talk I want to go on the their ledge. first commute. That no, we could fun. take a trip across that the bridge fun. together. I'll film it. Yes, that sounds good. Okay, um, I like that. So no, no like secret road or no like getting this lane and it's generally slower and nothing. Well, I mean, people have uh, problems going more quickly in the left lane for some reason. People don't realize that is considered the fast lane. Right. And I'm not telling you to speed, but you're supposed to go more quickly. And, you know, working the zipper kind of a thing and merging, people have issues with that. He here's my tip. Stay off your phone. Okay. Because the amount of crashes we cover with people being oh, on imagine. their phones. Oh, do you awful. yourself, in your personal life, when you're mm -hmm. driving, mm -hmm. do you have road rage? Road rage? Yeah. N not really. Um, I get annoyed, but do I'm not Do you like, consider yourself a super car. driver because you are the traffic expert? I'm a very good driver. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> no. Uh, and modest. I, I, yeah, and very modest. <laughs> no, I think I'm a, a fine driver. Um, in Montgomery County, I'm pretty good with alternates, knowing how to wiggle my way around things or through okay. neighborhoods. But I'll be honest, I, you send me to a random neighborhood in Virginia, and I'll kind of be like, Ugh, hang on a sec. Have you ever been in Chopper 4? Chopper 4. So I've been in it. I have not flown in it. Well, what are they going to do Isn't that? this crazy? Well, they're going to put that together. I know. I know. No, we, they, we do send um, people up in it. But mostly when I'm covering something, I need to be in the office. So I, I need to take a fun flight somewhere right. in Chopper. I have flown you an need A to, chopper. You but need not. to pitch it that you need like a real life like view from above, of bird's happening. eye view of what's going on, just yeah. so you can kind of get that. Maybe they could realism. pick me up at home even. That would be nice. <laughs> I'll look for you yeah. flying in the neighborhood. Yeah. Um that would be a hoot. You know, it's probably better off. I had a before the age of drones, I had to get in a helicopter to do some aerial stuff and I did I hated it. See, I flew in Denver, we had a chopper. Um, at that station and I flew in that for stories yeah. so I'd sit in the front we'd have the pilot and the photographer uh, in the back and you know we would point to problems on the road or whatever but I wasn't covering traffic it was cool though we did fires See, I, above. I, I hated it I hated the thought of it I Why? enjoyed it you don't think that taking off from a helicopter is the Here, absolute the coolest thing. you will here's feel in your entire what life what I was afraid of I didn't allow myself to enjoy it because I thought oh great Local film. I, I can see the news already tomorrow. Local filmmaker, first time in a helicopter, dies. You know what I mean? Like I kept I thinking of that. I'm, I'm a total worry. And I'm hanging out the plane with a big old camera. I yeah, just it, it didn't have anything good about it. And no, I can see what you're saying. It's nerve wracking. And but I probably stayed off, out way too just... late the night before just so, to mask some of those fears. And then that gives you extra anxiety. The and next day. It was didn't a horrible feel idea. good to my belly up Ooh, in the air. Oh, God. Helicopter. Yeah, that's not where you want to be. It is what it is. <laughs> um, okay, so I look at DJs, mm -hmm. like radio disc jockeys, um, kind of in the same light as reporters. 
in the sense that you're one town to town, mm-hmm. kind of like a Bon Jovi song, but one town to town, getting the next gig. Did you feel that? You went to Hagerstown, Denver? Mm-hmm. Hagerstown, D.C., Denver, back to D.C. Yes. I mean, that's the nature of the beast. So, you know, there are, I don't know, 218, something like that, mark, TV markets. Yeah in the country and you know the bigger the number the smaller the tv market is or the the town is where you're working so you want to work your way up to a high number and you definitely have to bounce around you know i have people who ask me for advice you know somebody oh my daughter is really into television or whatever and i'm happy to always talk to the people or email them and it's always like well i just want to stay you know, in my hometown, yeah. it's, it's really not realistic. I'm not saying it can't happen. It's not that realistic. You so do you feel lucky around. that you have done that? I do. I mean, you know, I had the stint in Denver. Um, I think I could have stayed here. I was at Channel 7 and 8 mm-hmm. and then went to Denver and came back to this area. I think I probably could have stayed here and, and made a good tape. But it's really, I think, good to see other things and go other places especially if you're going to be a DJ or a television reporter yeah. because things are just different in different parts of the country. Can you plan in your career? Meaning you're at a stage now in your life and your career, you have three kids, mm-hmm. you are close to family. I, I would assume both on both sides, yes, your husband's side and here. your side. Um, you've kind of planted roots with NBC Washington. Can you emotionally plan to be here for a little bit or yes. like how does that work? Okay. I'm here. You're here. As long as they'll have me, I'm here. Okay. If they won't have me, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> You're saying outside. Maybe I'll retire. Yeah. <laughs> so I always wondered about that. Because it's such a you know, there's always someone do you feel like there's always someone behind you? Well, sure. To, your job? Yeah. So you've got to be really good at what you do. Yeah. Make yourself stand out in some way. How do you do that? How do you do that? That's How do you a, make that's traffic a really good fun? Question. Well, I think I have fun with it. I mean, you know, if you mess up on air, it's okay. If you laugh about something with Aaron or Ann or Chuck or Sheena, it's fun. Yeah. People like it. You have to keep it kind of light and you have to know your audience. We do, like I said, a lot of research and we know where our viewers live and kind of who we are catering to and making sure that we're helping them the best way that we can. I think that now it's much easier for in this position for my personality for example to come through anybody's personality in my position when you have a reporter standing on the side of the road covering something terrible yeah. you don't have room for that but so that helps in what i'm doing that helps me specifically but it also social media is really great for that as well facebook and instagram and, and twitter and people feeling like they know you more you letting them in and sharing you know your triumphs and yeah. your tragedies with them was it a process to let your personality out no. when you first got that? It's a process to keep it in. Oh sometimes. my gosh. <laughs> Have you ever been pulled aside and like you gotta turn that down? No, I haven't. I haven't, but um because I kinda I guess I knew when to check it and when to, to rein it in. What's important is telling the story, not yeah. you know, telling about yourself. But that that wasn't difficult. It felt more natural for me to do traffic and to be able to kind of joke around and be yeah. more of myself on air. Okay. When you were reporting on the field live, mm-hmm. were you ever Baba Buoyed? <laughs> I was not. Never? No. Well, then you're not a real reporter no. I yet. know. I guess not. Oh, my goodness. I have a ways to go, right? So one of my clients, we started the first ever online TV station for like a business. Okay. And it was down at Dewey Beach, which was a little nutty. And uh, it was for the starboard. And we would do this like reporting segment where if any like running of the bull or whatever, we would send a person out there. Well, they didn't show up one day and I had to do it just because, you know, I trusted myself to do it and I had to take the mic out and get in the... So you were getting what we call MOS, man on the street. Yes, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I was Baba Buoyed. And I stopped the interview because I was so happy that it actually happened. Because every good, every reporter needs to be Baba Buoyed once. No, I ha- I don't think so. Now watch tomorrow. I'm going to text you and go. I was. I was totally wrong. <laughs> the guys at the anchor desk should Baba Buoy you tomorrow. Oh, great! Thanks for the idea. Sorry. Awesome. Uh, who are your mentors, or are your mentors, or were are? Um, Jim Vance was amazing. So I was going to ask about Jim. Tell me about Jim. Sweetest heart ever yeah yeah wonderful wonderful man um when i told him that we were we adopted our middle child and when i told him we were doing that um 
I remember where I was. We were at uh, somebody's birthday party, and he said, well, how much time do you get off? This is amazing. You know, I have people in my family who've adopted, and and he just thought it was really cool, and especially that she was biracial or is biracial. And we were talking all about that. And um, I said, oh, I only get two weeks, you know. And he automatically said, I'm giving you my time. I'm giving you my time. You're kidding. How much time do you need? I'm giving you my time. And I'm just saying that to to emphasize yeah. what a sweet actual heart he had. You know, he really was the nicest guy. And you just felt cool around him. He Whenever was a cool go, guy. Oh, cool guy. When we would go to parties and he would be there, my husband would be like, man, God, Vance. <laughs> you know, just, you want to be around him. He just exudes that amazing. And he was like a rock star. He was. Yeah. Total rock star. Wonderful guy. So he was always very sweet and I looked up to him a lot. My parents, amazing examples. Both hardworking, uh, both worked, you know, my entire mm-hmm. childhood. My dad's an entrepreneur, so he had restaurants, and now he owns a construction company. What um, restaurants did he own around here? So he owned um, the Bitter Lemon Pub, which was okay. on Goody Drive across from Wheel of Wild in Rockville. <laughs> Wheel of Wild, <laughs> which is now like an auto parts store. Is, yeah, something like that. Um, and then a place called Nickelby's in Germantown, which it's the facade is still there. Yeah. It's not, I think it's La Mexicana or something now. Um, and now... In construction, you know, built us a house a couple of years ago. Sorry, Dad, because when your dad builds your house, it's like, uh, were you a pain in the cost. butt? At <laughs> cost, oh. you know, it's not. No, I wasn't a pain in the butt. I was, I was just happy for somebody to be working for me for yeah. free, right? Um, and my mom's a teacher. She's in her forty third year. Wow, she's still, te- still teaching here. In Montgomery wow, County. Mm-hmm. unbelievable. So both of them really incredible examples for me um, throughout my childhood, but. I think it's always good to have somebody to really look up to. And my parents just, they never pushed us in one direction or another. They just wanted us to do what we wanted to do and be good at it. Yeah. Commit to it and be good at it. Do you have siblings? I do. So one brother, and he's my dad's partner. Okay. Oh, really? Yes. They build houses together. I love that. Close that family. Cool? Yeah. So was that, when you became a parent for the first yes. time, uh-huh. was that a lot of pressure to have those parents and to follow that? No, no, no. I you, don't, pu- you felt. Prepared. Oh, you mean to 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 kind of emulate them? Yeah, to like live up to those standards. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I really hold my parents to a hugely high sure standard. Um, so if I can be ten percent of the parent they were to me, yeah, I'm good. Do they know that? I'm good. They know that. Well, they do now. They they're going to be now. listening. Um, <laughs> no, they do. I have said that before. We had a 40th anniversary party for them a couple of years ago, and I think I said that. Um, when we did a little toast for them. Um, they are just awesome people. Yeah, They really are. They're my best friends. And we talk multiple times a day, which I know people think is so weird. My husband's always like, you know, most people don't talk to their parents multiple. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I got I to gotta see if mom has some napkins, right? Yeah, you know? <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> she might have my party supplies over there. I got to check this out. Well, you were in Denver, had your first son. Mm-hmm. Did you have... Any complications having your first child? Um, no, I had a loss before him. We had a miscarriage okay. before him. And it was, you know, first try getting pregnant, got pregnant right away. Oh, this is easy. And yeah. then it was an early loss at about six weeks. So I just realized I was pregnant. Sure. When it happened. Um, devastating. And you don't realize how many people are affected hmm. and how often this happens until it happens to you and you start talking about it. You probably didn't even know it happened before. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? yeah. Just thinking, Oh, I'm a little late or something, yeah. whatever. Um, so that was really, really hard because then it was in my head that there was a problem and we need to try and we need to start tracking things and, right. and, and making sure all everything works. But we got pregnant on our own with our son and complications. So I went into preterm labor at 32 weeks with him. So I started dilating, and they put me in the hospital for about a week, and then I was home on my back for, I think, another six weeks. And then they said, okay, you're good now. If you have the baby now, it was like 37 weeks, you can go back to work. It doesn't matter. So I'm back to work. I lasted a week, and then I had him. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the scare with him, and I was on at the time – they were giving pills every two hours. So my husband would wake me up every two hours in the middle of the night. What were those for? When I was on bed rest to stop contractions. Okay. So I was, uh, yeah, I was kind of a mess, but he came out perfectly healthy. He's great. 
Good looking kid. He's a good looking dude. See him he is. Drop off. Yeah. At school. He's a good looking dude. He likes his hair gel. <laughs> <laughs> he is kind of a preppy kid, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. He is. He sometimes. Who's he get that from? My husband. Yeah. Yeah. My husband likes his hair gel as well. <laughs> <laughs> they love their products. They like products. It's okay. So do uh, I. Not hair gel, but. So when you were thinking about a family, how many did you want to have initially? I mean, did you have even a thought to that? So when I, yeah. So when I started dating my husband, my in-laws would tell you the first time I met them, I told them I wanted to have five. And that I probably did because at one point I did want to have five kids. And then I had one. You had that conversation with them the first time you met I them. I think, I don't, <laughs> It wasn't like, what are you going to do for our Because I'm sitting here thinking, just, you told that one employer that they're gonna, you're gonna, they were going to hire yeah. you, and then you're telling your in-laws the first no, time you met no. them that you're having five kids. I don't, I'm pretty sure this is what they'll tell you. I don't think it was like, how many kids are you having, or let me Can't tell you what's going to happen. I know, right? I'm kind of a mess. But I think it somehow came up, and we, I mentioned five, and everybody, including my then-boyfriend, almost how does that fell somehow off come of his up? chair. I, I don't remember, <laughs> but they, they always say, oh, yeah, you said you wanted five. Um then I had one, and I was like, oh, my lordy lord, no one told me about this. What's going on? Wait a minute. I'm good let, with let me one go back one second. Your first date with your boy, and boyfriend. Okay. Why were your in-laws there? Oh, no, no, no. It was my first time. Would I say date? First time meeting my in-laws. I see. Okay. I, the okay. five kid Maybe thing somehow came up. I may have misspoken. I don't okay. know. No, that didn't. That's, I don't that's some first date. <laughs> Hey, what are you doing on <laughs> July 2nd, 2005? We're getting married, by the way. <laughs> um, okay, so you wanted five kids. That's been documented. And then I had one. You had one. And then oh, what was oh the next gosh. step after that? So um, after that, I definitely wanted at least one more, yeah. just a companion for our son. Um, we moved home. We started trying on our own. Tried for a year is what they typically tell you at that age. I was early 30s. And nothing. So then we went to a fertility clinic and got tested and everything. And our diagnosis was unexplained infertility, which is the majority of diagnoses now with infertility, which is, yes, it's not happening. We're not exactly sure why, because you test out fine. Your husband tests fine. This should work on paper. This should work. Yeah. But it's not. So during I was um, with that place for about two and a half, three years, I think. And during that time, we did IVF five times. So that's shots and shots, all sorts of things. Yeah, so my husband's giving me shots. I'm taking pills. I'm giving myself shots at work. It's very emotional. It is very um, upsetting because you're hopeful one second mm -hmm. when you see a heartbeat, and then you're devastated you know, a few days later when you don't. Very up and down. And it was a really hard time for me, as it would be for anybody. And I know a lot of people go through this. So I would, I was able to get pregnant. They would get me pregnant. I couldn't sustain the pregnancies for various reasons. Um, we found out with a couple that they were chromosomally abnormal, and that's what happened there. Um, I developed a blood clot for one, hmm. and that ended up ending things. Um, and then the last time we did what's called an egg retrieval, where you kind of, you know, jack up your inside. So instead of one egg coming out, you get 20. They retrieve those eggs through um, an aspiration, mm -hmm. a needle, and then do the little Petri dish thing and then put them back in. Um, but the last time we did that, none of them were what they call viable. Mm -hmm. So, and that was a couple of years ago before we adopted and when we found out none of them were viable, there's nothing we could do. Uh, they just weren't looking good. And again, no great reason. Um, we hit, had a trip planned. and We went on the trip and sort of talked about it. And my husband said, you know, if you want to, we can have another child, but we're going to do this. And if you want to adopt, let's do it. And I did. Hmm. I really wanted to adopt. Well, how many, how many losses did you have? A total of five. A total of that five. That includes the one before our son. Got it. Yeah. A total of five. What did that do to your... So I haven't talked about this. I mentioned it to you the other day. Mm -hmm. Prior, I have two kids. Um, prior to my our first one, we lost three. Same thing. I'm we sorry. did the... the um, she did the IVF and, mm -hmm. and all that. And it was... It was uh, so I know a little bit about what you went through and what the family went through. Well, you know a lot. Yeah. It's awful, right? Yeah. It sucks. It's terrible. Because the first time you have a miscarriage... Now, as I'm speaking as the husband... Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what it's like to, for you guys to go through that and 
you know, carry that around uh, emotionally and yeah, you physically feel as well. But inadequate. Yeah. Um, what's wrong with me? Why can the lady next to me at McDonald's be pregnant, but I can't? Right. If I get invited to one more baby shower, I swear. Yeah. That kind of thing. I remember those conversations. I get it. Yeah. yeah. I thought it was the, after the first one, you think, okay, well, these things happen and it sucked, but mm -hmm. you know, um, when it happens two times, you kind of go, okay, well, what's going on here? And then when it happens three times, it's like something's wrong, yeah. you know? Um, and it's devastating. It, it changes the relationship, I think. I mean, can, you know, it certainly affects it. Yeah. Um, because men and women, I don't feel, handle it the same way mm -hmm. exactly. Because speaking as a male, um, we don't know what you guys are going through, mm -hmm. you know, and certainly don't feel what you guys are going through. I think my husband wanted to fix it for me. Right. That's because that's what we do. Yeah. And he thought, I've got to be able to do something yeah. to make this better for us, for yeah. her. And there's nothing. And I was just sad. You know, I had this beautiful boy who was two and a half, three, four years old, five years old. I mean, yeah. you know, it was, went on for years and years. And he was perfect and great. And it's not that he wasn't enough. It's that I wanted, right. you know, somebody with him. How old was he during all this? Like two, three, four, five. So he's kind of getting what's going on. Um, A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think he was young enough. Um that he wasn't completely understanding. And we have we still haven't talked about it, and I will, obviously. I mean You know, I just thought about that. Now that I'm telling my story with it, I haven't told our kids. Yeah. Or we haven't told our kids. Yeah. Well, so I hope they don't listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep this away from the kids. Maybe a couple I more feel years. like Howard Stern. Maybe a few kids more years. don't listen to this book. <laughs> um, you know, I found myself w wishing she wasn't gonna go down that hole. Of despair you know mm -hmm. what i mean and sometimes i would like feel emotionally i was reaching out going please don't go down there yeah because it can be let me try and pull you back yeah yeah it's... i remember one time it was snowing in bethesda and she was i mean and i didn't know what to do i did not know what to do i felt like it was just going south really quick and i remember just taking off my shirt in a snowstorm and just i had i had nothing on it took, i let her walk a little bit in front of me and then you're I, outside outside in the snow okay and i was like i gotta get her like something. out of this yeah. something i need to do something drastic so i took everything <laughs> off i i walked i i dropped back a couple of steps so she wouldn't notice and took everything off and then i just walked up to her and i'm go what are you so upset about <laughs> oh did she love it oh yeah I mean, yeah it. but you can only do that so many times i know that but that's process. very sweet i mean any guys listening if you know your significant other is going through this that's a well, really now i do sweet it to my kids if, if my kids are like pissed off at me for something <laughs> i just take my shirt off especially when we're like i've done it at, like Places I shouldn't do it. It's become my. So you're thing. gonna get arrested. <laughs> Randy's an exposure. Why is this guy taking his shirt off in front of kids? I don't know. <laughs> this is super weird. Please don't arrest me at they're a restaurant. My, they're my. They're my children. <laughs> I have done it in a restaurant, and then have I put it back. Really? Well, it's a health concern, you know, because of. Uh, yeah, violation. Yeah, so I put it back on real quick, but just to get. It's the thing now to do. Why are we go? Why do I, we just went down a rabbit it, hole? This is your thing. I think thing. it might this be my not, thing now, and it's creeping me is, out. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, the whole point of that is you just got to do what you got to do to get through it. It's true. So, um, my husband was pretty good emotionally dealing with things. I, um, went and talked to a therapist and that helped some, Yeah. but I think most of all, I needed time right? because nothing really makes it better or makes it go away. It's just getting further from it. You feel a little bit more healed. Yeah. So you made the decision to adopt. We made the decision to adopt. Did you make the conscious decision to adopt a biracial kid? No, we were actually open to anything. Yeah. Um, and this is the one that kind of found us. Yeah. How, so, how did, what do you mean? So the way it works, and it works with diff different ways with different agencies. So if you're going to adopt, you decide if you're going to go domestic or international. And we decided domestic. And then you go, okay, am I going, am I going for a newborn infant? Or am I going to go for an older child? Um, sometimes with an older child, agencies want you to be open to something, um, a situation where the child has certain disabilities, emotional mm -hmm. or uh, physical, and like up to age eight, just kind of a big window. Okay. And we didn't want a child older than our son. That's the only reason we didn't go sure. that way. Yeah. The situations we saw would, would be older than him, and he wanted to be the did older Did you have brother. a conversation with your son? We did. But so we had a conversation with him about adoption in general, and he said that he wanted to do it. 
Um, I had taken him to Adoption Day in Montgomery County. So every year I go, it's in April, and it's like my favorite day of the year because you go and you sit in the courtroom and you see all these families become these forever families. Oh, really? Yeah. So the year that we were really thinking about it intensely, I took him with me. Okay. And I explained what was happening. And then I took him to Starbucks in Rockville Town Center afterwards, and he got a little drink, and I got something. We sat down, and I said, you know, what do you think? He said, I think we should adopt a baby. I'm going, yes, 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 yes. You know, that's I wanted him to have that feeling. If he had not had the feeling, I'm not sure what we would have done. If he would have said, absolutely not, only yeah. child, I don't know how we would have handled it. But thank goodness is, he was Is he an boy. old soul? He is. He's a super old soul. And I don't know if that's because... He was an only child for so long yeah. and around all these adults all the time, you know, living with my parents for some time while we were with them. And then he is, though, he's really, he says things sometimes that are so So our kids go to the same school. Yes. If I remember correctly, their science project fair thing uh-huh. was relatively near each other. And he seems like a little man, like yeah. a boy man. He's, yeah. He, he's, the stuff he says. Right. I mean, he's and just. hair gel. And hair gel and. You know, button-up shirts and cardigans. Button up shirt. You know, I mean, he's just. And look, I buy them because I think they're cute. You know, yeah. I, he couldn't wear them if I didn't buy them. I mean, it's kind of it's on me too. But he is this this older soul and definitely an amazing big brother. I now. will tell you this because you're at work. Your husband tends to drop him off. I would uh-huh. say we live literally like a block away from school. Okay. So because my kids are fundamentally late. It's usually a well, rush I, to get to we, school. I understand that my husband and son are quite late. So often. more times than not, your husband's in front of us when we're pulling in. I've never told you this. And then your son gets out of that car like he's ready to take over the world. <laughs> really? Yeah. Like he's got the energy and he's ready to go. And he's like, all right, see you, dad. And I always just get a, a chuckle out <laughs> like, of that. See, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I understand he skips into school. He my does. husband's always he like, skip. he's skipping in again. He's right. skipping in. He does. I love I it. I get to see that. Aww. It's so funny. I wish I could see that. That's but the thing I miss, right? Working in the I'm morning. I'm not going to take like... video because that would be creepy, but have your husband do it. <laughs> okay. I'll let him know. Uh, but it is fun sight. I've noticed that. Aww. Yeah. It's sweet. That makes me happy. Because the majority. You don't of, skip if you're not happy, the, right? I'm telling you what, the majority of those kids that get out of their cars are just like, oh my God, I gotta go to this place again. <sighs> yeah, right. Yeah. And my kids are like, we didn't eat breakfast. I'm like, well, if you actually woke up when I told you to. Then you'd be okay. Yeah. Now I'm going to be like, skip like him. Yeah. Follow him in. Yeah. He didn't eat either. But Using some like hair him. gel wouldn't kill you either. <laughs> uh, okay. So the adoption process, mm-hmm. when you brought her home for the first time, mm-hmm. what was that like? Unbelievable. So I was in the delivery room. Oh, when she was born. Really? Yes. So, so you got to know the mom. Yes. Right. So we got to know birth mom. Um, the way it worked is she was presented. Sorry, birth mom. Oh, that's okay. I'd... That's okay. I didn't even notice, but I normally do. Yes, that's very sweet of you. That's sensitive. Lots of adoptive parents want you know to be called mom and dad. Not. Do you still have contact with her? We do. It's open. How's that work? Um, I go on her lead. So if she reaches out, I respond. Are you obligated to, do they see each other? Um, they they should see each other once a year. Oh, they do? Yeah. Okay. So if that's what she wants, then okay. that, that's the agreement. Yeah. Okay. Um, is that, we, are those, we knew is that, that going into Is that hard? Um, I think it's going to be good for her in yeah. the long term because if she has questions, you know, and she doesn't look like mom or dad. So if she has questions or wants to feel like she wants to see where she's, you know, came from, that kind right. of a thing, I think that'll be good. And if we have questions, you know, God forbid there's a medical problem, we don't know history about right, something, right. I think that is good. Um, and then she can kind of make her own decision, you know, as she gets older, okay. how she feels about that. Because I think it'll be hard. And, I, and we were so anxious about it, I think, because we don't know. You know, we've never done this. This is new for us. Do you fret about that? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I do worry. I just want her to feel as loved right. and cherished as she is. And I always want her to feel that way. Um, you know, we picked her. We, right. get, we decided to do this. And we said yes to her situation. And then birth mother looked at us and six other families. Uh, you give kind of like a yearbook. And it tells all about your family. Um, and we have other biracial children in our family um, through cousins and stuff like that. So I think that helped 
our situation and birth mom picked us. Thank God. Hmm. Well, you know, at the end of the day, what I can tell you mm -hmm. is that your daughter is going to make whatever choices she's going to make yeah. down the road. Mm -hmm. However, she's going to feel about you guys exactly how you feel about your parents. I hope so. So regardless of what decision, decisions that she makes, yeah. you're always home. I hope. I hope so. Yeah. I think, I mean, she's a fabulous little girl. And I just can't wait to see everything in store for her. I just adore her. Yeah. So that, I mean, that was a big thing, you know, yeah. like news covered it. and Yeah. So, um, you know, I was so nervous about it ahead of time because you just, you don't know if it's going to go through, Right. you know, our birth parents going to sign the paperwork. Oh, even like to the very end of it. Yeah. So um, in, it varies by state, but the revocation period changes by state. So where she came from, which was a state in the U.S. out west, um, it was a shorter revocation period. In Maryland, for example, it's 30 days. After birth. Yes, oh, which means wow. birth parents have 30 days to sign. So whatever or, whatever period you had, was that like the longest period? It was a long period. Yeah. It was. Very anxiety-producing right. period. So once we got through that and signed, that was like, you know, the pictures on my phone, it's like all these holding or holding or holding her. And then you can tell the change. And like when we signed everything and everything was good, we're like jumping up and down, yeah. you know, signing this paperwork. And then um, we had to stay in the state for a while because the paperwork goes to your home state and then they sign off and they send it back and then the baby can cross state lines. Oh, so really? So we were there for 18 days. <laughs> Wow, Did you, you don't think about that stuff. I know, it's really wild. We didn't realize that we got the bill from the hotel and it was like, a, oh, 18 nights, I guess. Thank you for your 18 nights stay. Oh my God, what? We're here for 18 nights. Um, but it was nice. It was this family bonding thing and my son came out and my parents came out and so we all had this Great. nice time alone with her. Wherever that was, uh -huh. do you, um, is that like a special place now? Yes, it is. Yeah. It is a special place. It's really special. And, and I know we'll go back. We went back yet last year oh, good. to visit. For that reason. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then um, we'll plan to go back again soon. So my question, it was covered at NBC Washington. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, I'm going to speak for you. Okay. So on one hand, I would assume you want to spread that news that this is a good thing and this and that. But at the, I look at it as... On the other side of the coin, you want this to be as normal as possible because it is normal as possible. Yes. So that dichotomy between I want to spread the news, but I also, by talking about it, makes it different. Yeah. Like so, she's my daughter. She's not my adopted daughter. Right. But the mere the mere fact that there's a story about it makes it different. Yes. So how did, how did you deal with that duplicity? Well, I think that I talked to my husband about it when when um, my bosses and I spoke and they said, you know, let's do something on this. This is neat. And it could it could be a good thing. And we decided to share our story because we felt it might inspire somebody. Yeah. It might show somebody that either there is hope here, you know, to still get pregnant, to keep trying that kind of a thing. And here's my story about that. Or if there's not hope for a biological child and you know, you're open to adoption. A lot of people are open to adoption before biological children, which I greatly admire as well. However yeah. you build your family, it's yours and it's beautiful, right? So we just decided that sharing our story with people might help. And you wouldn't believe, so we did the adoption story right after we brought Barrett home, pretty much. And awesome reaction. Uh, Barbara Harrison, who, God, speaking of mentors, I should have mentioned Barbara. Love her to death. Yeah. She's fabulous. And of course, she's done Wednesday's Child for, I think, mm -hmm. 35 years at the station. She was a huge, huge blessing and help during that whole process with me. I mean, she was always there to pick me up or give opinions about things. She's amazing. Um, but we decided that it would be more good than harm mm -hmm. to share and inspire people. And Plus you're documenting it. Documenting it. And so many people reached out and said, thank you for doing this. I'm thinking about it. I've talked to dozens of people about adoption, how to go about it if you're starting out. And then we did the infertility story later. And that got huge reaction as well. Maybe even more reaction. I'm not sure. But emails and phone calls and questions yeah. and, and people, you know, just looking for hope. Right. Well, that's what your story is. Yeah, it is. So... You have a third child. How'd that happen? 
<laughs> Good question. No, when we left all the fertility place, the doctor said, listen, there's nothing quote unquote wrong. And I really think you're going to get pregnant. So that's what happens. You know? So you Okay. So I didn't want to just come out and say you didn't go through fertility clinic or, or treatments for the third. No. So that's what happens. Yeah. And do you think it's mental? Um, you know, I don't know. Because that's what I'm happened with sure. us. We stopped fertility and then stuff you had two. and then had two. Yeah. I'm sure there's a component of you're not thinking about it. So now it's going to happen kind yeah. of a thing, whatever that is, you right. know, physiologically, you're more prepared, whatever. Um, but I was getting pregnant. It just was, they, it wasn't working, you know? So I'm not sure. Okay. Like, yes and no. But I just think that she was always supposed to be right. with us. Right. And so here she is. My husband thinks, you know, he's like, oh, you're crazy. Like theories of everything. He's happy to have her. So I believe some everything nuts. happens for a reason. See, so do I. And I think you had to lose. It sucks that yes. we lost three, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't have the two that I have if that didn't happen. I know. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, and, I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. I know. I think about it all the time. I think about the five. Um, and I think about, you know, the ones that we have and thank the Lord for that. But when, so Barrett was five months old, our middle child. And I looked at my husband, I said, I just, I feel weird. It was the day of my son's birthday party, his sixth birthday. And I said, when you get those bags of ice, can you get a pregnancy test also? And he went, for who? I said, well, I'm pretty sure there's only one person in the house that can get pregnant and that's me. So it would be for me. <laughs> um, so he went and brought it back. And as you know, 30 first graders were running into the house, I'm taking a test and I called my husband in and showed him the test and he was like are you kidding so it's this huge joy oh my gosh no way but it's also with my track record i mean you're excited but not really because yeah. is this gonna last is this is this real am i really pregnant and really excited and really happy or you know is this going to be another heartbreak at 12 weeks or something like that i think the biggest part of that story that you just said mm -hmm. is that you're not selective and weeding out kids for birthday parties no <laughs> That's 30 kids. <laughs> 30, I know. Well, he has like 12 cousins. So. Uh, between you and me, you don't sit there and go to that class list going, yeah, I don't want that kid there. <laughs> no? That kid's a jerk. I'm not having that kid. Um, don't, no, I feel, don't I have egg on my face? We've, I know, right? We've, we're going to have to limit birthday parties now. I can't do these blowouts for 30 kids three times a year. So you mentioned, thank the Lord. What role did faith have throughout that whole process? Oh, gosh. Or did it? So we're Catholic. Yeah. Both my husband and I raised Catholic. And um, I would say both of us are religious. He's very, uh, I mean, he's, he's church every Sunday. Yeah. I am um, maybe more spiritual than he is. I was constantly praying, constantly bartering, constantly begging. Yeah. Um, you know, my God to, to help our situation. So I would like to think that in the end it worked perfectly because I feel like if there wasn't something watching over me or someone watching over me, I wouldn't have what I have. Yeah. And everybody has their own, their own thing, their own belief system, their own, you know, way of, of feeling spiritual or connected to a higher something or, or not. Yeah. You have to find <coughs> your own inner peace and then figure out what works for you. But what works for me is, feeling more connected. I remember standing in church a lot when um, Barrett's birth mother was pregnant and just praying that she was okay, the birth mom was okay. Yeah. Like, please watch her. Please make sure she's all right. Um, I've referenced this before on the this thing. Um, Joe Walsh, the guitar player mm -hmm. for the Eagles, uh, mentioned he was interviewed, I think, by Men's Journal, I think, and it was asked, "What you know? What's a life lesson that you kind of cling to?" And he said, "You know," and he referenced someone that said this, and I, I can't recall who that was, but when you're going through a trouble or you know a, an event in life that sucks, and it seems just like worlds are colliding and and you know just pain and heartbreak and stuff, when you get past that and through it, when you look back, it all looks like a very well written book. It was chaotic in the moment, mm -hmm. and you're surrounded by chaos. But when you look back, it all seems to have worked out like a very fine written story. I like that. Yeah. That's really beautiful, actually. 
Um, it was a really hard story. Yeah. It was hard and, and gut wrenching and depressing for a long time. Sure. But how did you persevere? My son. Yeah. You know, I mean, when you have somebody relying on you and you need this happy face and you need to put one foot in front of the other, you know, yeah. you, you, you have to just keep going. Did you ever want to stop thinking, all right, well, I have him. I no. feel this way about him. And no, no, my husband was ready to stop because yeah. he couldn't stand seeing me go through all of it. And then, you know, getting attached to what we thought was a baby and then, you know, which was a baby, but I'm just saying, which we thought was going to be a baby in our home yeah. and kind of preparing. And then it wouldn't happen. Um, See, we go into survival mode. Yeah. And want to fix Men, things. You're saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So w when we went through it, I've told her this recently. The worst part about it for me mm -hmm. was, well, when do you find out that you lose those things? When you're sitting in a, laying on, you guys are laying on the desk or whatever, yeah. desk, um, getting the sonogram. Yeah. And you can tell from the, the technician, face. the oh, face God, and, the face. and yeah. you know, the, the it's, looking, it's, it's usually moving. confusion. They're looking at things and they sometimes call somebody else in. Yeah. And it's that. And then you look down at your wife and then she's like, what's going on? And then you know what's going on in your heart. Mm -hmm. and it's just like, oh, no, it's, it's going. So does she. She just. Yeah. And it's just ready. watching her come to that realization mm -hmm. sucks. Mm -hmm. That's the worst. That was the worst part yeah. for me. It's terrible. Yeah. It's so awful. I mean. I just feel, I hear so many stories about people going through the same thing and it just breaks my heart because yeah. it puts me right back there. I know exactly but, how it feels. But good things happen. Good things happen. I yeah. have three beautiful babies. There you go. Yeah. So let me do the math here. You got three kids, <laughs> right? One, two, three. And I'm going to carry the four and the seven. So you have two left based on what? Two what left? What oh, oh, oh. You mean <laughs> based on what you told your in-laws on, on, on your first date. Yeah, I think, um, Yeah. I think we're good right now. Okay. I would go for another one. You don't have any announcements if to make I get, today? No, <laughs> <laughs> if I did, my husband wouldn't even know yet. He'd probably come after oh, me. Oh, this could be one of those things. It could say something now and we'll get like number one on the podcast list yeah, or something. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, I could have, if I could have one just like the baby, Colette, yeah. who is the most angelic little angel she's just the sweetest chubbiest most amazing well i think that's a headline are you saying that colette's your favorite child is that what you're saying no right but now? if i could have another one like her oh, i would I take it because right. i think she's an easy three you and just, she'd be an easy four you just gave your other two complexes <laughs> um last question yes um where did you develop your i'm not going to quit mindset why would you stop treading water right yeah. i mean why would you give up why would you put your head down or under yeah. you can't you got to keep going uh-uh i want to make my parents proud i want to be proud of myself i want to show my kids what it is to work hard my son came home with something for mother's day and it was a flower and it had descriptors of me hanging off of it and it said you know four or five things and one of them said hard worker really and that really, that might be thrown around a lot, but that really touched me because he notices. Sure. He knows I'm getting up before anyone should ever have to wake up in this world to go into work to give them a good life. Yeah. Right? So I think him noticing that is kind of all I needed. I was like, all right, goal. Yeah. Life made here. He knows. I feel like a broken record a lot because I bring this one analogy up all the time. So people probably think I'm a, I don't want to be looked at as a one trick pony because this is my Even one thing. Even with the shirt thing? Even that, with the shirt thing. thing. <laughs> that is my other thing. <laughs> um, but why is it that the Indian rain dance works? <laughs> what? The Indian rain dance. Go with, work what? with me here. Work with me. Why is it that it works? Yeah. Because you believe. No, they don't stop. What do you mean? Oh. Until it rains. I gotcha. See? I like this. And it's true. It is true. I mean, there's nothing magical about that dance. That's true. I mean, you know, please okay. don't email me that there is something there magical is about magical. it. But let's just say for the sake of this conversation, okay. there's nothing magical about that dance. Yeah. They just... They keep doing it. I could do that right now. Well, it's like the kids turning their PJs inside out, right? If you could do it a hundred times in order for the snow to come yeah. and no school to happen. Eventually, eventually it's, it's going to work. Yeah. So... Keep doing it. Yeah, keep doing it. Keep doing it. I like the rain dance. It's like the rain dance. Um, all right. 
last couple just to wrap up uh how do you use social media how do you brand yourself um i think i find myself quite boring aside from having three really awesome kids yeah so a lot of my posts and stuff are all you know if it's not on twitter i do first four traffic and that's all traffic stuff and then i have also melissa malay my normal personal handle so it's you know not a really opiniony it's just what's happening in my life kind of a thing um i'm a mom i'm working i'm trying to make dinner i'm trying to get enough sleep was i good to my kids yesterday did i yell too much you know i mean that's that's so you, you go through that too i go through all of it i go through all of it and that's that's mostly what you're going to see on social media that and a lot of fun stuff at work because we have a great time together um uh, what has been your favorite failure that led to a breakthrough Oh my gosh, favorite failure. Uh, I don't know, I guess, so I was nominated for another Emmy last year and um, did not did not win, somebody else won. Uh, so this past year I thought, let me put a little more into this, let me do some different things um, with the green screen, let me try a couple of new things and see, and so I was nominated again this year and we'll find out in a few weeks, so fingers crossed. So I guess that, I mean, I guess it was a failure because I didn't, I didn't win it, but it's something that I really want because I, I need three. You understand? I have three children. I hear right? you. So child one has already claimed the one. It's in the dining room cabinet. <laughs> By his bed. Now I need two more. <laughs> no pressure, <laughs> Melissa. <laughs> See, I would be tempted to make up stuff. What do you mean? Like, like you know, j- j- you know. Like this is also an Emmy Award? No, you like mean? when you're doing the traffic. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, wow. Oh. When I so when I, how I put myself through college was I worked on boats in Old Town. Oh, that's cool. And they were touring boats, so sometimes I had to get behind the mic and like say, "Well, if you look and to you the would right, make it up? I would make stuff up all the time." No, oh, all the time. These people. These people standing there. We took a picture of oh, this yeah. lovely cottage where Abraham Lincoln lived on the water. Yeah, and it's not. No. <laughs> My favorite was that awakening statue that now yeah, yeah, that's yeah. now at National awakening Harbor. Giant. It used to be at Haynes uh-huh. Point. Oh, the, the 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 background story to that changed every week. It was awesome, but you don't feel ever you like even inside of you. You don't feel like the like how funny would that be? Like on April Fools. How funny? Well, the funny thing I've always wanted to do is wear just green. Yeah, and in like be a green, floating green, head and just hands. Be a floating head. Yeah. yeah. Um, I pitched it once and I was told no, don't do that. <laughs> I wanted to do it for Halloween. My boss was like, yeah, not funny. <laughs> what is that thing you wear in your leg? <laughs> that is, so it's a strap, kind of like an ace bandage. I wear it on my right leg, and it's nude in color, and I hold a mic pack on it for a lavalier mic. Okay. That goes up, you know, the back of our dress. How come that doesn't, oh, uh, because it goes up Because we're dress. wearing dresses, yeah. yeah. And then a um, IFB box, which is a like a Secret Service agent earpiece. And that wire also goes down the back of our dress and into our legs so that our bosses can talk to us. Is that confusing when you're trying to... At first, yeah. Now, I mean, you could read me a book while I'm on air and I wouldn't hear a dang thing. So when you're on the green screen, mm-hmm. it's reversed based on what you're looking it at. It is. It's like looking in the mirror. Is that hard? Mm-hmm. What well, was it hard? Like for the first couple days, maybe yeah. a week, it was a little bit confusing because I hadn't... They call it working at a green working a green screen. I hadn't worked a green screen before in my life, before three years ago. Yeah. There's no reason for me to stand up there, walk back and forth. And there's a, an art to it for sure. You don't want to walk sideways. You need to kind of face forward, shoulders forward. You know? Are you teleprompting? No. Oh. No, 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 no teleprompter. It's all, all in my head. It's all in your brain. Yeah. Uh, where can people find, oh, no, I have one more thing. Yes. So what? this is what we do. Oh, no. At the podcast. Um, you have to pass the baton now. To? To whoever you think might. Our viewers, listeners, and viewers might listen to find to be find interesting. Interesting. Hmm. Who do you think? How about Dominique Dawes? Yeah, the former Olympian. Okay. Who she's a Gaithersburg High School grad. Yeah. She would be cool. G Burger in the house. G Burger. All right. A fellow G Burger. And where can people find you? Uh, on Twitter. On and you know all that stuff. Sure. So on on Facebook, I have two accounts. Follow my professional account. Uh, Melissa Malay, and I'm wearing a blue dress in that one. Um, Instagram is Melissa Malay, and Twitter is Melissa Malay, and also at first four traffic, the number four. And we tweet every traffic crash in the entire area every morning. So if you're on there, you're going to know if you have a problem. 
I can't possibly get. And do you mind TV. from now on by for me? Texting. Only let, let me guess. You want bypassing to bypassing the Twitter? Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's completely fine. I have lots of people who are like, "Can I? Wait, I'm going to the airport. What do you think?" I'm like, no, you're good. I always will look. I'm always happy to tell you. So speaking of traffic, I am headed down Thursday night to. Two. I think you would love this pre-planning that I. I think I have. I'm going to the Capital One Arena oh, yes. to okay. watch the viewing party for the Capitals. Take Metro. Because at this recording, I'm hoping, well, we're up three games to one. Yes. And we're going to take it. By the it. time this is posted, I'm hoping we have taken it by then. Okay. My plan, because I don't do the Metro. Okay. Why? <clears throat> you're, just, you're not going to do it. I used to. It's just, I don't like it. Okay. But do you, do you I don't want to be drive a sardine. into a sea of red? That's the thing. That's the thing. Well, I don't Neither do can. Metro because I don't like to be a sardine anymore. And it's just people smell. I mean, let's just be honest. And it's crowded. And I get like. Why don't you go down super early? So I'm going to go down super early. I'm okay. pulling the kids out. Don't tell, you know. Okay. Got it. The, the principal. <laughs> and uh, we're going down super early. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to park four fly blocks away. Okay. That way, when I leave. there's You not need to use one of those parking apps. And get a parking spot in advance. We'll talk about that. Ooh, see there, that was your tip. Okay, there's my traffic tip. tip. Okay, yeah, you got to do that. All right. Well, thank you so but much. I still for, say you should take metro. <laughs> I can't do it, especially after a game. Okay, there's going to be a million people down there. I know. Do you take the metro? I do. I don't. I'm actually it. taking the metro Friday to go to the Nats game. Yeah. yeah that's your. That's your okay. choice. <laughs> I won't go on that thing. <laughs> I used to all the time. That thing. Yeah, it's just. Come on, it's getting better. I know. I just don't like being in a little box. I don't either. In underground. But I'd rather, I'd rather be in a box than just sitting, you know, on the 14th Street Bridge or something. I would rather take Uber. Oh, I'd take Uber, but still, getting Uber getting you down there doesn't really help you that much. I'm not in a box. I can get out of that car anytime I want, even <laughs> like movie style when he's rolling, and I can like roll out of the car and roll around a little bit just to get out if something does go down in the car. <laughs> which you know, movie I love style. Uber. Tell him to slow it down before you go out. <laughs> Um, All right. Well, thank you so much for coming in. I've enjoyed the conversation. You're welcome. And, me too. Uh, Thanks we'll for talk having soon. me. Absolutely. Cool.